Ladies and gentlemen, I think we will make a start. Chatham House has been gathering internal and external expertise to examine the effects of, you know what, uh, the coronavirus's, coronavirus's impact on the Eurasian region. And, and today we're, we're going to concentrate on, on Central Asia, of course. Um, to do this and to reach a larger audience, not least an audience in the region itself, in Central Asia itself, we've linked up with the invaluable Institute for War and Peace Reporting. Um, I suspect you all know the IWPR, um, it's incredible work in supporting civil society and conflict in conflict uh, afflicted regions. And I'll leave my co-chair today, Abakan Sultan Azarov, uh, the IWPR's uh, regional director for Central Asia to say a few words in just a second. Before I do that, some boring uh, admin uh, and uh, scheduling points, if, if I may. I'm sorry, I know you're probably quite familiar with this after three months or so of lockdown, but I, and, 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 and innumerable Zoom calls, but I must just get through this as quickly as I can. Please bear with me before we get on to the interesting stuff. Um, we've chosen this meeting format uh, because we like it. It's a, it's a good thing where we can see everybody. So if you can turn on your cameras, that's wonderful. Make it as, as normal as possible uh, these days. You are, however, having said that, uh, muted, and we don't trust you that much, uh, for the duration of the speaker's presentations. Uh, but when it comes to questions and discussion, uh, we will unmute you. Um, the speakers will present up to seven minutes each. I'll introduce them in a second, and then we'll have Q&A as normal. For, to do Q&A, you probably know this by now, uh, but you can either type it into the chat room, either to me personally, if you want to be anonymous, or broadly, if you want everybody to see it, um, or you can raise your electronic hand in the participants tab at the bottom of your screens. On technical stuff, my colleague Quinton Scribner, you can probably see him, he's waving right there. Um, he's on hand if you've got any questions. If you've got any questions, you can select his name in the in the participants tab again and you can write to and you can write to him if you need something. Um, finally, obviously it's a slightly difficult uh, to, to do these, these events uh, very much under the Chatham House rule. So we're, we're on the record today since there's 140 or so of us um, online. Now, more interestingly, four terrific speakers today, um, two from the region, two externals if you like. Uh, Marlene Lavoel, I'm sure is known to you all. She is the director of the European Russian and Eurasia Studies Center uh, at the Elliott School of International Studies at George Washington University. Um, Marlene will talk about the immediate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the region's development uh, with a particular focus on the economy. And I would highly recommend Marlene's and um, uh, oh, Madeleine McCann, I think it was, uh, Ponar's Eurasia piece on FSU responses more broadly. It's still a, still a very relevant piece. Uh, secondly, Erica Marat is Eric Associate Professor at the College of International Security Affairs at the National Defense University and Erica will speak about the immediate domestic uh, and politics um, and security issues in Central Asia. Uh, Erica joins us from Washington and is therefore possibly just a little sleepy this morning. Bear with her. Um, Sherbek Jurayev is the director of Crossroads at Central Asia. Uh, Sherbek will look at the medium term impact in the region uh, with a focus on three themes, particularly debt, dependence and democracy. And last but not least, Iskander Aklibayev, uh, director of the Kazakhstan Council on International Relations uh, we'll talk about the foreign, foreign policy dimension, including efforts to project soft power within the region. So that will take us about half an hour, maybe just over, and then we'll devote the remaining time to discussion, let's say. In the meantime, I'd like to welcome and reintroduce my, my co-chair, Abakon Sultan Azarov, just to say a couple of things before we start off. Abakon, over to you. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, James. Uh, dear experts, dear doctors, experts, analysts, ladies and gentlemen, let me also welcome you all to our online discussion. You know, recently our world uh, faced various challenges all caused by the pandemic. Yet the world in a sense has become smaller and closer as uh, our discussion demonstrates today. I think today we have a brilliant opportunity to engage in a joint discussion with our Chatham House partners, local experts and international scholars. The topic we'll discuss is of immense importance for Central Asia. The new post-COVID uh, world awaits, and we have to have, we, we have to have a beacon in our path of development. And I am very much sure that our discussion will establish such beacons and a result and uh, tangible recommendations for the future of Central Asia. So I would like uh, to wish all of you uh, to have a productive, and constructive discussions today. Good luck and appreciate it for your time. James, back to you. 
Okay, thank you, Abakhan. Obviously, Central Asia is a region of a, uh, a disparate nations. It always has been, always will be, I'm sure. We all, people tend not to be experts on all five countries because of that, actually, in general. One exception to that is Marlene Rauel, who is expert on so many things, as to be said. I read her work on the Arctic and on Russia. It's quite extraordinary, I have to say. Um, but uh, as I've told you what Marlene is going to speak about today. So Marlene, thank you very much for, for coming. Um, and over to you in the meantime, please. All yours. Well, thank you so much, all of you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I was asked so to kind of open the discussion by giving a, a broad perspective on the immediate impact of the pandemics. And as we have seven minutes, I will mention seven issues by one minute uh, uh, each. The first one I think that is really interesting to look at is state capacity and preparedness. And of course, as everywhere else, the, the pandemic is a test on the system of each of these countries, a test obviously on the public health system, but also very inter inter interestingly, sorry, a test on political communication, on the way the authorities have been managing the discussion with their own society. And also, of course, a test on the capacity to enforce lockdown measures. So this kind of state capacity preparedness, I think, is, is, a, is a good way to look, is a good prism to look at how the Central Asian state have been reacting. And without any surprise, we had, I think, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan managing pretty well, Kyrgyzstan managing halfway, <laughs> Tajikistan managing pretty badly, and Turkmenistan being still in denial. So it's a quite good reflection of the general uh, uh, picture, I think, of, of these uh, uh, five states. My second uh, point and notion would be the one of uh, accountability, especially in relation to humanitarian assistance that has been arriving to Central Asia. The European Union has sent a lot of uh, money and equipment, the US, the World Health Organization, several other uh, international organizations. So there are millions of equipment that have been reaching the region. The question is, of course, how is the redistribution going on on the ground? These countries have, of course, little accountability, high corruption, and a tradition of state agency smuggling, whatever they have been given by the, the, the international community. So here, once again, the crisis is reinforcing a feature that we already know, which is that it's very difficult to function and send uh, uh, assistance in countries where the, the level of smuggling by state agencies is so high. And so here also we will probably have, we already have stories coming on on how things are managed on the ground. My third point is about the resilience of the societies. And of course that will be related to the social economic impact of the crisis. And we will be coming back on, on that after Sheerbeck and, and other will be discussing that. I mean, and for Kazakhstan, of course, combined with the collapse of all prices. And so it will be difficult here also to measure the, the resilience of the society, especially because the job markets in the regions are very often informal. But globally, states are relatively poor to have important package of measures that would help the private sector and people to, to go through the crisis. And so that's interesting to follow both civil society initiatives to try to create network of solidarity to f get, increase the resilience of the society, but also to see the emergence of possibly oligarchs of local benefactors who want to build their reputation by suddenly acting and, and uh, organizing some kind of charity uh, action in the region, helping the, some social groups to, to, face the, to increase their resilience. Fourth point is, of course, inequality. As in the Western countries, the crisis is particularly strong on those who are already the weakest, the poorest, uh, the one the most in difficulties. We have both social, economic, and geographical pocket of poverty all over Central Asia. And clearly, the crisis is, of course, uh, uh, harder, uh, hitting them harder than, than the, the richer. Uh, uh, region and social groups. And as you know, in for Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan in particular, we have already huge issues of malnutrition in rural region. And clearly there will be food safety issues in the forthcoming months for several of uh, the groups, especially in these two states, but more globally for the rural population. Fifth point about migration. As you know, tens of thousands of labor migrants blocked in Russia. Here also, it's not specific to Central Asia. Many people who were not at home when the crisis happened have been blocked in a foreign country. 
but the central Asian states are either too poor or not interested in trying to send planes and take their people back home. The Russian authorities are not very generous in taking care of the, the migrant. And so what we have been noticing, of course, is also a decrease of remittances sent to the region and even some reverse flows of money going from Central Asia to Russia. So probably families helping their, their migrant uh, uh, blocked in Russia. So all that is, of course, showing the, the degree of reliance on Russia, which is a weakness, but it's, I mean, it's both a, 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 a carrier of wealth and a weakness. But it's also show how much Central Asia is globalized, right? And when the world connectivity stops, then the region is very much affected because precisely it's globalized through its uh, migrant. Six points about the cooperation and integration uh, uh, issue. The Eurasian uh, uh, Economic Union has totally stopped working with Russia closing its border, even with, with Belarus. Here also, interestingly, nothing specific if you think about how the European states have been closing their border without any coordination between themselves and with uh, uh, the European Union institution. But I think it's sending for everybody uh, a signal that national interest matter the most and that regional integration is work well when everything is good but when things are bad <laughs> then every state is back to its own national border and managing its own crisis and not really cooperating with other so here also a signal that maybe will have some impact on the way on the long term on the medium term on the way people perceive the Eurasian economic union and my last point is about the society compliance to lockdown measures and here also i think we have really interesting elements to study here also nothing specific if you think on how it's difficult even for european countries to enforce uh, lockdown measures but if you think about a lot of social issues that central asian had to face and had to dis navigate the lockdown measure like for example attending funerals going to mosque, managing the end of the Ramadan in lockdown situation, soon pilgrimage to Mecca planned for late of July. So you have a lot of, let's say, cultural elements that make that the, the level of compliance to lockdown measure is kind of challenge and people have to adapt and be innovative and inventive on the way they can manage what they consider important in their everyday life in terms of societal uh, uh, solidarity and family connection and the lockdown measures. So that was my brief uh, uh, seven points and I think I'm more or less on the, the seven minutes and I will stop there and uh, uh, let the others continue. Thank you. You're absolutely uh, right on the money with the seven minutes, uh, but that was a super tour de région, uh, Marlene. Thank you very much indeed. Really appreciate that. Erica, you've been no less prolific in the last uh, few, uh, few weeks and months, so it's terrific to hear from you. Um, over to you, if I may, with no further ado. There'll be plenty of questions. I've got plenty for Marlene um, already. So has Abacon, I can see that. But um, we'll just go through the speakers first, I think. Of course, thank you for having me today. And um, I hope everyone is doing well, uh, wherever you are. Um, so I'd like to build on Marlene's points. Um, she really did an excellent job outlining the broad picture. And I'd like to emphasize that um, the, the divide between governments um, um, poor governance on the one hand and suffering in the society is really widening. And um, Central Asia does not really have um, anything new to offer in its analysis, you know, in, in, in the analysis in general, um, in a comparative perspective, because um, we see this, the trends we see in Central Asia, we see all around the world um, in developing or developed countries. Uh, but um, some of the negative uh, features of um, of these developments have been that um, government, governments are unable to provide sufficient information to the society or honest information to the society, uh, unable or unwilling, um, and also unable to um, deal with economic fall down of um, the um, lockdown of, of, of the of eco economy, so stopping of economies. Um, that's on the one hand. So. Uh, poor governance. And, and then on the other hand, of course, expand, expanding poverty and extreme poverty um, in pockets of Central Asia um, that, um, and exacerbated by um, the um, slowing down of migration um, and slowing down in remittances. Um, so 
and the impact is going to be felt, the economic impact is going to be felt for the years to come. Um, populations um, all across Central Asia won't be able to find enough jobs and we will still are to see uh, what kind of migration dynamics will take place um, after uh, the pandemic slows down as well. So, but um, one thing that I am uh, specifically worried uh, in the context of Central Asia is um, inten uh, the intensity of autocratic politics um, accelerating amid the pandemic, especially in countries that are undergoing some, some elements of political transformation or transition. So Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan in particular, um, they're all facing uncertain uh, political developments. So in Kazakhstan, who will be the next uh, leader of uh, the country, Kyrgyzstan is going to hold parliamentary elections this year. And in Tajikistan, the president is grooming his son uh, to become the next president. Um, and it looks like that the governments are using the pandemic to expand control over society and over political opponents. Um, we know that in Kyrgyzstan, the, the parliament is currently considering passing a law that would uh, limit the work of NGOs and the law is 95% uh, plagiarized from a prototype in Russia. Um, in Kazakhstan, the government is moving uh, to control political mobilization and uh, protests um, that we've seen, the type of protests we've seen before the pandemic. And in Tajikistan, of course, there is a uh, more violent uh, rhetoric against uh, political opposition, um, Kabiri, especially the, the leader of um, the Islamic Renaissance Party. Um, and um, this is not helpful uh, in dealing with pandemic because of course expanding economic grievances in the population will lead to um, spontaneous mobilization, will lead to civic um, activism. Um, and what the governments are doing, they're basically, they're cutting uh, communication and trying to uh, marginalize uh, civic voices and voices from the, from the society um, in, in the public space. Um, and this is a very dangerous mix. Uh, we know that, uh, especially from Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan's uh, experience, that without governments responding to um, quote unquote street politics or uh, mobilization in urban and rural areas, this kind of protest uh, um, dynamics tends to escalate. We've seen spontaneous protests now taking place in Tajikistan, something that's uh, both rare and um, unexpected. Um, we've seen how um, in Kazakhstan, the activists feel even more pressure I mean, uh, in, in the pandemic. And um, going forward, I think it's a really dangerous mix for radicalization of politics in uh, Central Asia and for um, greater clashes between um, civil society activists or um, just you know, regular citizens and law enforcement or even um, armed forces um, in some cases, um, specifically in, Taj uh, in Tajikistan. Um, so this is very dangerous. And I think um, having this divide and having economic grievances expand um, in the society um, also uh, makes societies vulnerable to um, disinformation, to being uh, becoming victims of um, fake news um, that can also lead to uncontrollable uh, mobilization or unexpected mobilization against uh, a variety of issues. It can be something at the border um, in rural areas or um, in urban areas, uh, specifically in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. And then finally, um, I'd like to uh, also mention that um, with um, economy uh, breaking down and um, more and more people feeling uh, the, the, the lack of economic opportunities. Um, I think um, more people will be uh, vulnerable to exploitation, um, to, um, um, to, you know, they, they may become uh, victims of um, organized crime, uh, of, of human smuggling, um, of uh, various, um, 
you know, various criminal um, or criminal activities uh, that we already see in Central Asia, in Central Asia be that drug trafficking, um, human trafficking, you know, human smuggling, um, extortion, um, and um, and so on. So um, these are the big bigger trends. I, I do want to uh, finish my. Um, presentation by saying that just like in the uh, rest of the world, we also see uh resilience in the society and mobilization of charity networks, of um, helplines, and um, we do see um, the, you know, some, some of the positive mobilization in the society. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So many issues there, including the, the one about the da dangerous risk of, uh, of increased radicalism. It will definitely come up, I think, in, in the discussion. Uh, Sherebek, over to you. You seem to have picked all the Ds, debt, dependence, and democracy. I don't know if it was on purpose, but uh, go for it, please. Hello, everyone. It's great to see over 100 persons while sitting still in my office, uh, some benefits of the current conditions. Uh, to start with, I think one thing that we can say for certain is that uh, the implications of the COVID for Central Asia, in this discussion, the only certain thing is that we may have more questions than answers. So whatever issues I would bring up and others will be bringing up, I think these are preliminary and tentative. First, because the virus is still spreading and Central Asian statistics are unreliable on their own and in general in the world, but still they show no sign of where the peak may be. If you look at Tajikistan's, the other last week, I think, one day you have 200 new cases, then zero, then 400. There is no way to judge about the pattern and trends. So. On the, in that sense, uh, statistic meaning being meaningless in general on this uh, COVID, we're still somewhere and we don't know where, at which stage we are. But uh, since we have about six minutes or seven minutes, I would like to mention several things. And for some reason, they all start with D. Indeed, I preliminary mentioned, I would mention debt and dependence and democracy. And probably I would even add disparity uh, as a one, Sentence. And in general, the whole COVID thing is a disaster. So, uh, but we know that disaster is a very generic term and for some people, disaster is an opportunity. So we may need to go a bit detailed. The first thing is a disparity among Central Asian states, which already was mentioned, I think, uh, by both Eric and Marlene. We have to acknowledge that the Central Asian countries, whenever we discuss Central Asia as a region, we have to acknowledge that these are different countries and over time, they're becoming even more different and COVID will probably expose and also augment this disparity, particularly in terms of the trade balance. Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are heavily import dependent countries. The imports three times are more than the exports and that statistics doesn't hold for Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. So these two countries heavily dependent and if the COVID will bring to greater protectionism in international trade, these two will suffer and I think already suffering very much. And second, of course, remittances. Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan have been in the top five of the world in terms of the dependence on remittances for past 10 years or so. Uh, nothing to be proud about, but still we are the leaders there. And this COVID crisis happened to be the type of crisis that hit there very much. Previous crisis, somehow we didn't even feel and actually remittances helped to cover up the big problem of non-existence of local economies. And now the problem in Russia and Kazakhstan, the host countries for remittances, will not cover up, but actually expose the degree to which these countries lack self-sustainable local economies to run on. So that's the disparity thing. And second, the general kind of deepening dependence uh, of Central Asian countries on external actors. And here probably I will be speaking more about Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. This, the second half of the region. One issue is the deepening debt issue. Uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan again are among the very few countries in the world that have very basically were on the verge of the upper ceiling of the external debt to GDP ratio. We are heavily indebted basically and particularly uh, given the fact that about half of our debts are owned by China. The repayment of debts is very much dependent on the, how good your economy is. So we've been borrowing with the hope that the economy will grow and will be able to repay. And now the COVID meaning is, means that the local business is basically sitting at home, businessmen. 
remittances, the free money coming from Russia is dropping. Uh, tax revenues of the government are dropping. So there are all conditions that we will be having problems with repaying, plus we will be needing to borrow more and more to actually support the budget, which we are doing now. Uh, we're going to IMF, to European banks, Asian bank, everywhere. We started it early to the credit of Kyrgyz government, but uh, that's nothing to be happy about again. And second, on the dependence issue, I think the one interesting dynamic will be to watch the Russia-China dichotomy. These two countries that are basically hold lots of cars for Central Asia, the Russian economy will be a huge variable. If it for some reason picks up fast, then the migrants will kind of stop being a big problem for us. Remittances will probably keep going on. But again, uh, we have here China. China probably is the number one country which will uh, recover earlier. And it's been already been a huge source of economic or free capital for Central Asian states. And uh, even I think today in the Radio Liberty, there was a news article saying that maybe China is now becoming even more than, it's already a hard power in Central Asia. And so that division of labor that we used to talk about when we discuss Russia and China, that probably already doesn't hold true very much. So COVID will probably lead to even augmenting of that problem. And finally, Erika already mentioned quite well on the democracy issue. Indeed, I think in Kyrgyzstan, uh, in Central Asia, we see that the COVID leaving up this debate about big state versus small state, which in our, in the, in the, in Bishkek, basically, mostly it's about the, whether authoritarian states are be, being more successful than democratic states in covering, uh, in addressing this COVID issue. I don't think there's a predetermined way in which COVID will affect the democracy issue. In general, you know that you perfectly know democracy is becoming a very unpopular and exotic term in Central Asia in the past several years. But Kyrgyzstan evidence suggests that indeed the, the two main pressures for democratization, which are tension, uh, pressure from below and pressure from outside are both weakening. And uh, the COVID is basically helping those things to just further. So I, I suspect that the vocabulary and even values of the liberal democracy will further weaken, but not necessarily at the expense of creation of strong authoritarian state. Most likely the civil society will increasingly feature illiberal nationalist chauvinist kind of groups who will hold account, government accountable, but not in the ways that we would like to see. I guess I may be hitting my time, so I will finish here and uh, I'll be happy to continue on this in the questions and answers. Thank you. Vivek, thank you very much indeed for some very original points there. And I note the uh, slightly pessimistic note you, you end on because many people think that civil society can be a savior in this aspect. Obviously there's a lot of work for IWPR, but uh, you're saying it'll actually bring up some of the nastier, more illiberal voices. So that's a, that's a fascinating point to end on. So finally, Iskander please, as we always sort of end, uh, end on the foreign policy dimensions. I know you want to concentrate particularly on soft power. Over to you, please, sir. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to certainly start from the kind of geopolitical implications of COVID-19. Uh, the year 2020 started as an ideal storm, starting from the, the Iranian conflict and the, the, the killing of uh, General Soleimani. Then we have uh, OPEC uh, scandal or tensions with the, inside the OPEC and the fall of oil prices. And after that, we have a COVID-19 and the spread and a sense of unpredictability around the world. So. Uh, in the later terms, we see that the negotiation between China and, and US are becoming more, more uh, uh, quite difficult. And we latest, uh, in the last terms, we saw that US had actually withdrawn from the, the Open Skies Treaty with Russia. Uh, we have uh, Arms Control Treaty, which is, which is uh, ending uh, on the 5th of February last year or next year. And US government is telling that uh, China should be part of that treaty as well. So COVID-19 became kind of uh, the new, new dimension of old traditional geopolitics and uh, the sense of unpredictability and pushing us uh, towards some kind of new, uh, new reality, how to operate uh, within the you know, online format. The G20, G G7 meetings are operating early in uh, online format and 
in, in traditional term, diplomacy is also passing through its transformation. So-called Zoomplomacy is a new term, actually uh, bringing us to a new reality. And in every negotiation, when you speak o online, you cannot kind of transmit your own ideas. There is no emotion, no handshakes. So it brings a kind of sense of uh, something uh, as a hidden agenda. So for in this respect, if you talk about the geopolitical aspect of COVID, uh, Central Asian states, some of them uh, in most cases are part of the um, uh, kind of broad uh, integration uh, unions like Eurasian Economic Union, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Belt and Road Initiative, where all Central Asian states are part of. So in this respect, it's very challenging how those integration mechanisms are going to play out within the economic slowdown and uh, the global lockdown. So in this respect, I believe uh, COVID-19 is going to be, uh, not change the, the whole reality, but certainly accelerate the global process. And we need to, uh, to think about how we are going to adjust this reality. Recently, President Tokayev actually was taking part in the Eurasian Economic Union meeting of heads of state where he actually a little bit criticized the, the proposed uh, strategy. And it was, there was a big outcry from the different sides. And uh, recently we have uh, had a meet, last day, uh, yesterday we had a meeting with Valdai Club discussing specifically Eurasian Economic uh, Union and how we're going to progress in that direction. So from, uh, we see that from the different sides, there are different questions, how Eurasian Economic Union is going to play out. Uh, rightly mentioned that the remittance uh, for, or from, uh, from other Central Asian countries, from Russia, for example, is another question because uh, some countries are really dependent on that. And with the lockdown, how are they going to play out? Uh, speaking about specifically uh, China-US uh, relations, this is a very big issue and uh, this competition brings a sort of unpredictability. Uh, I cannot say that it's going to be a cold war in the old uh, sphere, but uh, the really the elements of cold war are going to have economic, technological, and, uh, and the soft power elements. And there is a great debate whether in case the stakes are going to be high between two countries, what are they going to be put in the, this kind of uh, dichotomy? Are we going to choose US or collective West or are we going to uh, choose kind of Eurasian side within this respect? So COVID-19 um, accelerates the global process and brings unpredictability. So we need to adjust to that. Speaking specifically about soft power element, we saw that China tried to kind of play out uh, this pandemic and criticism for their own benefit. So so-called mask diplomacy where China was sending. By the end of March uh, 31st, China has sent a uh, kind of millions of masks to 120 countries and four global institutions. So there is another element so-called as uh, health Silk Road where China is also started cooperating with Central Asian states on the health and medical sphere. So this is going to be really uh, interesting uh, element of Belt and Road Initiative and whether China is going to um, put forward this dimension because there is a talk whether with, with the economic slowdown, whether China is going to uh, promote the, this initiative in the Central Asia or around the world. So this is kind of very interesting uh, point to make. In terms of the soft power, some Central Asian countries try to use this element like Uzbekistan helping assisting Tajikistan or Kazakhstan sending the masks to Kyrgyzstan, etc. So this kind of state-to-state uh, -state diplomacy is still, going, is still there. There is a question why Russia didn't help Central Asian states to, in, in terms of the, the medical sphere, uh, rather that it choose, uh, chose uh, to, to assist Italy, for example. So um, speaking with the Russian experts, they usually say that um, Central Asian state didn't suffer mu as much as uh, Italy, for example. That's why we, we try to assist them in this respect. So the, 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 the global pandemic is a kind of a black swan uh, that emerged in the beginning of this year. And ability to, to learn how to, to work on that issue is, uh, uh, is going to take time. And I believe that during this year, we still have a year to sort out this problem. And uh, this uh, unpredictable situation and unknown uh, future is going to, to, to certainly put uh, pressure on the governments. Uh, speaking about specifically Kazakhstan, uh, it certainly showed, show, showed that some, uh, some kind of weak points of the, the government institutions, how, uh, because they didn't know how to operate and integrate 
their services in the, on the online format. But uh, need, it, it's important to say that there was some positive elements from the, the, the government side, for example, specifically Kazakhstan, where it provided like 4.2, uh, $2.5 billion, specifically assisting 700,000 companies and entrepreneurs and uh, providing some kind of $100 for like each month for people who actually uh, were limited in terms of the income. And, but I, cannot, I, I can disagree with Erika, for example, specifically on the, the, the political side of the COVID-19 and how it affects Central Asian governments. Uh, certainly there are uh, some elements where the mobilization of people and the, the, the emergency situation can kind of uh, be very attractive uh, to the leaders of Central Asia to, to prolong that and to, to work in that dimension to, to kind of mobilize people and limit their freedoms. But uh, in speaking in terms of the Kazakhstan, we recently had uh, the National Council of Public Trust where the, some packages of political freedoms were uh, actually passed through the parliament, specifically on the peaceful assemblies, the parliamentary opposition, the, uh, the quota for 30% for young and women in terms of the gender and uh, uh, age quality. So there are some elements where uh, governments are trying to kind of push forward the, 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 the political agenda. But at the same time, I acknowledge the fact that we're not certainly ready to uh, face uh, the, the, the pandemic in a, in a full capacity. So in this respect, capacity building is another point that I will agree with uh, Professor Marlon Larwell uh, that our governments need to learn how to work in the dimension. Because I believe that the, the pandemic COVID-19 is going to last during this year until the time we find a vaccine and then we need to, to spread it to the other countries. Then there is a competition of which country is going to uh, kind of issue the vaccine and how to work in this dimension. So the, the, the global competition on the, uh, between China and Russia, uh, uh, chi China and US uh, uh, is going to be there for a long time. And the COVID-19 only will, go, will add up the fuel to that competition. And we need to learn how to uh, sort these uh, problems up. And maybe for Central Asian countries, this pandemic can be a, a sort of uh, the challenge that we acknowledge. But at the same time, speaking about the oil resource and oil oriented countries like Kazakhstan, it can be uh, uh, beneficial in terms of the, to find out new resources like human capital, uh, to find out new uh, economic development strategies because we cannot count on oil with the, this uh, low oil prices. We not, can, cannot live in the, the same way how we lived before. So in this respect, I believe that COVID-19 can bring up a positive uh, development, but certainly it will depend on the civil society, uh, political will, and the general public uh, understanding to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Iskander. And whilst I agree with all of your broad geopolitical points there, one of the things that must have most uh, intrigued me in what you said was a tantalizing thing where you mentioned there was a Valdai discussion yesterday in which I uh, wanted to discuss the Eurasian Economic Union. So if I have time or if you have time and you can weave it into subsequent responses, I'd very much like to know what the Russians were proposing as far as the EU is concerned. Having said that, I don't really want to speak myself. I think I better get into the discussion. We've only got, only, we've got 15 minutes left. Um, and uh, I will start with a question from my co-chair, from Abakhan of the uh, Regional Director for Central Asia for IWPR. Abakhan, um, here's your question. <laughs> uh, a renewed spirit of regionalism was emerging in Central Asia, uh, manifested most overtly in the Summit of Central Asian Leaders in Astana in 2018 and in Tashkent in 2019. So the question, which is asked to Marlene, but really anyone can do this, but we'll go to Marlene first, is will COVID-19 facilitate or hinder um, <clears throat> because of the economic crisis, regional cooperation in Central Asia. Marlene, yeah, please. that's that's a good point. I'm not sure we know for the moment. Of course, the hope would be that it would help developing the regional cooperation. At the same time, the trend we are seeing all over the world is that um, regional institution have been kind of shaken by the, the the crisis. I mean, if we look at the way the EU had difficulties responding, at least at the beginning, I think that doesn't send the right signal on the sense that uh, regional or kind of uh, supranational institution can help. Because when you have this kind of crisis, it's usually the more the the authorities are local, the more they take the decision immediately. So it's really like like state and then region and then municipal authorities. 
But, but I think, so I think what will really matter in terms of regional cooperation, it's maybe more what Iskander was mentioning, that how the relationship with Russia and China and the relationship between Russia and China will evolve, that could kind of impact the way Central Asian leaders see the need to really increase uh, their regional cooperation. I'm not sure that the pandemic itself will really kind of foster them to work together because they can be on a competitive, you know, they are, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan are competing for sending their migrants. I mean, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan have more complementarity, but it's still difficult. So my impression is that if regional cooperation increases, it will be because the relationship to Russia and China will be changing more than because of the, the, the direct pandemic effect on the region. Thank you very much, Marlene. Actually, that, that does lead me into the question I just sort of hoped to ask you, uh, Iskander. Could you, could, you, could you elaborate on the, since, since Marlene referenced you, and my, I was curious about your Valdai meeting yesterday, and the EEU is supposed to be about regional cooperation. I suspect it has different motives. Then perhaps you could just take that one on for a second. Well, uh, there are certainly kind of uh, questions from the Russian side, whether we're going to, what is our position specifically on the Eurasian Economic Union, specifically after the, the President Tokayev's uh, statements on that regard. Um, yeah. uh, well, speaking frankly, we had uh, within the Eurasian Economic Union, we had some discrepancies and differences on how we see and how we perceive Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, Kazakhstan perceives this union as a, uh, solely and only as an economic union, where, my, where Russians, stemming from their own, uh, their own proposals on the uh, common uh, shared uh, kind of parliament, uh, currency, uh, it has some political elements as well. Uh, Belarus has its own uh, dimension. So Kyrgyzstan and Armenia, kind of, they, they may have their own agenda in this respect. So specifically Kazakhstan, we try to kind of diminish the political element because uh, it's not, we're still, it, it's very, it's, uh, it's a raw organization. It's only how many, five years old and we cannot speak about some kind of really serious integration moments. And President Putin actually, he said himself, uh, during another meetings uh, in Russia that we still need the time to kind of develop and discuss that. <laughs> because Kazakhstan is going to be a chairman uh, uh, soon in the Eurasian Economic Union, the strategy uh, until 2025, which was not adopted and ratified, uh, wasn't accepted because in this kind of unpredictable situation during the pandemic and this kind of online format, we cannot kind of take uh, this responsibility of uh, uh, taking a new strategy in this very challenging times because when we're when we're going to become the chairman of Eurasian Economic Union, we need to kind of sort these problems that we kind of created this time. So in this respect, Eurasian Economic Union is a kind of uh, still in the process of making. Uh, mm -hmm. As Chinese said, that uh, Belt and Road Initiative is uh, only seven years child. <laughs> so that's why uh, we cannot expect much from that. Um, certainly, there are mistakes, but we need still have a time. We, we shouldn't rush. Uh, the, 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 the process. From the Russian side, they didn't speak much. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I mean, on a related note then, just, just to keep you there for one second, Iskander, before I do bring everyone else in and, 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 and go on to other matters. And then people talk about the possibilities for cooperation uh, between, or increased cooperation between China and Russia, but Dr. Pravesh Kumar has also just, has just written to me, and it was exactly the same question I was going to ask, is, is surely it makes more, it's, it seems to me more logical that if you consider that China and Russia were diverging in so many ways, it will actually increase the competition between them rather than the cooperation between them. Well, uh, we wrote an article 2016 specifically uh, with my colleague, Daniel, whom you might know. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we specifically wrote about the bargain between China and Russia uh, on, for Central Asia. And yep. as uh, Sherbek rightly mentioned, this kind of concept of division of labor is not well received in Central Asia and well not, is not well received in China as well because the, the Chinese way of operating is uh, certainly on the public level, it's multilateral. We need to cooperate and we need to cooperate. On the de facto, on the practical level, it's uh, bilateral uh, mm -hmm. uh, cooperation. And for them, uh, limiting themselves to specifically to economic side is uh, limiting their uh, political moves in the future. And certainly they, they will need to uh, protect their investments and uh, protect their, their own kind of uh, strategic vision to the region. But we need to acknowledge the fact that 90% of Chinese trade 
is being done in the sea, in the, in the maritime Silk Road. Uh, and the biggest issues they are facing now is in the South China Sea and uh, uh, in, in another direction rather than Central Asia. And we need to understand that maybe the competition is not so high between Russia and China in Central Asia. It's just what we want, would like to see that to making Central, Central Asia central in, in, in the eyes of others. But speaking frankly, we're not so much very interesting in the, in the eyes of the kind of Western powers and uh, the, the, the Chinese and the Russian. For them, the, the biggest competition is going to be in the sea. And that's why, Thank you. That's why it's going to be the biggest problem. Good point. Well, much appreciated. Thanks for elaborating on that. Um, before I move on to a Turkmenistan question, actually, then can, can I just ask Erika or, or um, sorry, can I just ask Erika or Sherbeck if they've got anything to add on regional cooperation? Um, I agree with everything ha that has been said. Co COVID is, um, it, it, there, there are lots of unknowns, but um, one thing I want to add is, um, I think uh, just like in domestic setting, you know, in domestic context that uh, the pandemic is uh, expanding economic divisions, I think regionally we'll also see some countries recovering much faster and others, uh, like especially Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, um, really taking more time to recover because of um, also dependence on uh, migrant remittances. And um, this further, you know, Asymmetry in economic development uh, may um, make uh, may slow down uh, economic integration. In, uh, sorry, regional integration and regional cooperation with uh, states like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan really becoming uh, even more economically and thus also politically influential in the region. Thanks. Shit, I anything to add? Uh, not much to add, but I can only uh, stress that probably we don't have to try too hard to see the COVID impact on everything. The Central Asian Regional Integration has been half dead throughout all the 30 years, this was little ups and downs here and there. But uh, mm -hmm. if you look at the kyrgyz tajik border issues developing in the past couple of years, and the developments last week, I think, was again shooting and mutual accusation, there is no single sign that uh, we have desire on various sides to speak more, to speak better and more constructively. So I wouldn't exaggerate the COVID implication, but at least as of now, there's no sign that the COVID will push towards greater cooperation. That, that's a really good point. Thank you. I think you're, you're absolutely right. Sometimes we sort of maybe even, we do slightly over egg the COVID pudding and there are other issues out there and maybe COVID is, 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 a, is a massive new factor, but at the end of the day, some of the pre-existing problems are, are, are still there. Thank you. Now, um, I warned you, uh, we uh, haven't really looked at a lot of, we're going to focus on Turkmenistan. It didn't really come up in the presentations. Um, I've got a couple of questions. I'll try and weave them together. But Alex Folks, um, uh, a long-time election observation uh, official with the OSC and uh, uh, ODIA, has asked, looking at, looking at particular Turkmenistan, we've seen food shortages, he says, caused by the decision to close the border of Iran, huge impact on the economy caused by the oil price crash, et cetera, et cetera with a country seemingly in a very weak state due to the large impact of COVID-19, what do the panel feel is the long-term future of the country? Is there a risk of it becoming a focus of a power struggle between outside powers? China is seeking to increase its regional influence as well as access to oil and gas, um, uh, and to Iran with its networks of influence in Turkey, et cetera. Um, uh, so an all clashing with, with, with Russia, so sort of seeking to preserve its historic buffer zone. And and yeah, do, do, we, need to, do we need to consider uh, you know, what's going to happen to Turkmenistan, considering it's sort of, I suppose, you know, more on the North Korea side than the Norway side of, of countries. And, you know, it's, it's, partic it's, it's, it's been one of the, I think as Marlene Laroyal put it in a previous article, you know, it's been one of the outright deniers uh, of any impact of, of corona, any, any, any evidence of coronavirus. So what, what will happen to this most unusual of countries? Do you, I don't know where to go first particularly, but maybe Marlene, as I just referenced you, it might be best to go to you first, Marlene. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's really difficult to know how things are developing in Turkmenistan because we are lacking, really, just globally, lacking even more information, yeah, information. than for the, for the other countries. But as uh, uh, it was said just before by Sherebek, I, I wouldn't 
put too much emph emphasis on the COVID-19 crisis per se. I think they are just kind of long-term mm -hmm. trends that are happening now in Turkmenistan. So the, the difficult uh, oil and gas prices, the relationship with China, uh, uh, the difficult relationship with both uh, uh, Iran and, and Russia, that make that slowly the way the regime was used to function is kind of getting challenged. And we can see, I mean, difficult to say, we can see. We know that they are kind of, there is a, a rising uh, uh, migration. There are more and more young people trying to leave Turkmenistan. I think on that, we have some data because we can see the number of, for example, Turkmen students trying to leave the country to, to study abroad. So we can see the regime is losing what was making it functional uh, uh, for several years. And then the COVID-19 will just be one more layer in the crisis, but I'm not sure it will be the layer that will make the system uh, change but clearly the trends are going uh, in, a, in, a, in a very difficult uh, direction e economically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else wish to come in on Turkmenistan in particular? As, as, as Marlene says, it's, it's, it's the country we simply have the least information about. They've closed off um, so much. So it's, it's, it's maybe hard to say anything with, with, you know, which is of any use. Uh, I don't know if Erika or Sherbek, anybody is going there wants to come in on that? It's fine. I can happily move on. <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> Okay, um, I am going to go to a raised hand, actually, if I can find it. It's Baliha Sanghera. We will unmute you, please, and you can not listen to me for a change. I'll be most welcome. Baliha, we've, we're, hey, we're unmuting you. Hi. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the really interesting presentation by the, by the panel. Uh, China has come up several times. Um, and in relation to debt, uh, the argument here is that that because uh, uh, some of the countries are indebted to China, there, there should be some sort of uh, maybe some sort of uh, stop in their payments, uh, some sort of debt cancellation. Well, not not debt cancellation, but some sort of delay in the debt to China. Um, whilst I can understand this argument, would this not also apply to private lenders as well? To banks, um, so to more commercial. So should we not also be applying this kind of same principle about delaying debt payments, not only to external global powers like China, but also, especially as a, a lot of the panelists have said, the people that have been most affected are the vulnerable people, people who have taken out microfinance loans, very vulnerable they, they depend on remittances, perhaps, to pay for the repayments. So should there not be a, some sort of a strategic uh, uh, um, strategy by the, by the Central Asian countries to ask the commercial lenders to stop asking for repayments? Okay. Thank you. Baliha, thank you very much indeed. I appreciate that. But I'm going to marry it with a question from Mira Shirinbeev. It's very related. He says that... Uh, two of the Central Asian countries are members of the uh, Eurasian Economic Union. Two more are involved in a Eurasian project by having some Eurasian Development Bank projects. Will COVID stimulate Central Asian countries' interests to, to Eurasian economic integration? Um, uh, is, is, is that possible? Uh, is that possible over time? So, uh, Sherbeck, over to you, I think. It's mostly for you, perhaps. Well, uh, on Balihar's question, Hello, Balha. Great to see you finally for so many years. Yeah, uh, during COVID, uh, on the issue of private lenders, really for Kyrgyzstan and perhaps for Tajikistan, but I don't know very much. For Kyrgyzstan, it's been a big issue of those who work on and or the, who work on live on this kind of small credits, short-term credits, and suddenly their business is just uh, shut down or at least locked for some time. I don't think that. Uh, well, the the issue is clear and big, but I don't think the government has capacity and resources to do anything meaningful for them. So be, except China and except the private lenders, there's also government with its taxation. They, what I hear from my colleagues working in the tax agencies in Kyrgyzstan is that the government is really blocked, stuck on that. Rhetorically, they say that, okay, we will at least we can uh, prolong the period when you can Pay, we, you just postpone your payment of taxes. We can't just uh, forgive it. At the same time, the tax inspectors are receiving clear orders that 
generate money whatever way you can. So uh, I, I just the other day, I've been speaking to someone working in the tax. So the government itself has not been able to relieve uh, people of taxes. So I'm not sure it has any resources to do to ensure some strategy with private lenders, be it microfinance corporations or banks. So, but uh, compared to China, of course, that's a very day-to-day -day problem uh, at covering or uh, touching the lots of vulnerable people, small businesses in Bishkek in particular. But I don't think we have any strategies. So that's why I say that we have lots of questions and we are just living day by day. And we'll mm -hmm. see how it goes. Yeah. Thank you very much for an interesting answer. Uh, complex question. Now, I'm, I'm going to shift the topic slightly. Um, Tony Borden has reminded me that perhaps, perhaps we've slightly played down the medical and humanitarian crisis here. And, and I think if I sum up his question, it's, it's what happens if, it get, if this gets worse? Um, we've seen in Russia, you know, again, denial followed by a spiraling of a crisis and it just gets worse and worse. Belarus as well. Um, and maybe this is going to be true for Central Asia. Maybe it's simply behind the curve, if you like. So what are the prospects if we see a spiraling of infection and deaths um, for these countries? What would the humanitarian situation uh, uh, look like then if this simply gets worse and worse and they are, they're, uh, let's say, two months behind you know, the UK or, or, or Italy in this respect? And would it change the political dynamic um, or undermine any of the strong Central Asian governments of the region? Um, so my, the basic question is, is, what if this spirals to an, an even worse level than it has done before? Um, maybe Erica, please, perhaps. This is a very important question, of course, the humanitarian uh, cost of, of the pandemic in Central Asia. Um, so to begin with, um, I think all across Central Asia, to a larger extent um, in uh, Tajikistan, uh, the society uh, generally can't really trust uh, government data on the real um, picture um, in, in, inside their countries. Um, and um, uh, there has been, of course, just like in many other countries in the world, there has been a huge toll on the medical workers. Um, and there has been also this typical reaction by the government uh, to shut down any complaints, uh, suppress any complaints from the medical personnel um, about the conditions in which they work. Um, and we've seen this throughout throughout the region, um, in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, of course, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. Um, I think um, we will continue to be in this picture of lack of transparency um, all across Central Asia, not really knowing the real toll. Um, and um, the estimates will vary uh, about how many people really died or how many people are um, infected. But um, now that we see some governments uh, reopening, so in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan reopening uh, cities, we really see people are um, trying to um, jumpstart uh, the economy, trying to survive somehow. And um, unfortunately, yeah, the, the risk of uh, the virus uh, staying is, is very high. Uh, one of the, I think one of the, um, uh, concerns in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan has been that migrants who are returning from Russia, who are able to return from Russia, are bringing new cases um, of uh, COVID and it's very hard to quarantine them um, or to control, to make sure that um, the quarantine is enforced. And um, yeah, so it's, uh, it, it feels like although the initial lockdown was effective in uh, really uh, preventing the bigger uh, catastrophe, I think uh, there will con be continuing, you know, spread of, um, steady spread of, of the pandemic, and maybe the governments will have to um, resort to lockdown measures again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Erica. Anybody else on, the, on these gloomy predictions of vivid spirals, please? Marlene, perhaps? Yeah, no, I, I agree with, with, with Erica, and I think the... Um, one of the difficulties is that lockdown is a decision that works mostly for rich people and rich country and rich social economic groups, right? When you are poor, the point is your social economic survival more than your health, right? And so I think as Erica was saying is that people really care now to try to see how they can survive economically and the health issues is almost secondary until the moment they can be themselves <laughs> uh, uh, mm. infected. So I think the 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 first lockdown worked pretty well. The second one will be much more difficult to kind of enforce just because the, the economic heart 
the, the economic uh, uh, heating point has already been made and people are really now in, in a dire social economic situation. So as everywhere, a second wave would be really difficult to manage because the societies are not ready for, I think, a second lockdown. Understood. Thank you very much indeed. Anybody else there? Sherebek, perhaps, on a, on a gloomier picture, by all means? Well, yeah. No obligation. Uh, all of the topics that we discussed really were all about less about the health and the virus itself, but all yeah. about the government measures, right? Yeah. The quarantine, the economic uh, implications. Indeed, uh, most likely the situation will get worse uh, because Kyrgyzstan in particular started the quarantine very early on to the credit of the government. But now there is no resources in the government to continue with that. And I think if the virus goes spread further, most likely we'll have to just uh, accept that. And uh, the pressure on the hospitals will most likely grow in case things get out of control. So it's hard to predict. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many more migrants will come from Orenburg or St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. Whenever we have buses coming, bunches of people are being tested positive. So uh, that's gonna be an issue. And I don't think government wants to think about it, but they know that this will be a disaster for them again. Thanks, Shevek. Um, Erica, I'm going to come back to you with an extremism question again, because I think it's something you mentioned and Martin Sokolov's answer asked a question. But in the meantime, that's just a, a word of warning to prepare yourself. But uh, Kati, I'm going to go and so, look at economics and, uh, and business for a second. So it's possibly to, it's possibly to Shevek and, and Marlene, I suppose. Um, Kartika uh, Angriani, I may have pronounced that wrong. I am sorry if I have. She, she asks, do you know if any of the Central Asian countries have developed a kind of national plan to coordinate diverse actions or activities to support their citizens and businesses? Uh, we know that the economic crisis uh, brought by COVID-19 might impact local economies for years to come, but uh, do governments think of a more coordinated approach by having a sort of a national plan or a national strategy? Sherbeck, I presume, for starters. Well, I, I don't really know for all Central Asian states. In Kyrgyzstan, yep. the government is coming up with some documents saying this anti-crisis plan. I don't even know how it's called, but that's certainly not what probably the question means. This is a very short-term uh, planning of how we are going to relieve local businesses and so on and so on. Uh, at, at the moment, uh, there's not much of planning because Kyrgyzstan, unlike other countries, doesn't have much resources to spread. So we all depend on how much money we generate by talking to IMF, Islamic Bank, EBRD, Asian Development Bank, and so on. So any plan will depend on what resources you accumulate. So uh, on paper, we may have some documents and the government is certainly reporting that they're developing anti-crisis plan for second stage, third stage. But to be honest, uh, I think uh, we're still in the middle of the crisis and uh, they will need more time to reflect. And there's also even government turnaround happening. I, most likely prime minister in Kyrgyzstan will, may get sacked in the coming weeks or months, who knows? So not really with op much of optimism there. Indeed, got it. Malin, any national plans you're aware of? Yeah, well, uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are ready to put some money on the table to try to help their businesses. And of course, the point is especially important for Kazakhstan, and I guess Iskander can develop more, more on that. But of course, as an old country, having been able to put money on the side in a kind of uh, a national fund, there is all this discussion, as you can have in other countries, about which kind of money should be withdrawn from this kind of national fund to be put in the economy right now. But I guess Iskander could probably develop more on that than me. Sure, Iskander, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, as I previously mentioned that Kazakhstan has um, taken the early measures. Uh, it imposed the emergency uh, and quarantine on 16th of March. Uh, and then uh, we moved forward, just uh, limiting the, 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 the activity on the street, etc. So. Uh, it hit the economy and government tried to kind of uh, sustain um, and provide some assistance to the people and like 4.5 million people received the, the, the kind of $100 assistance each month for two months. But I mean, the, even the number 4.5 million people, it's one third of the, the population. It means that there are some problems if people are asking for help. So it means that uh, the ec economy is still kind of is growing up and IMF has pointed out that the, the, the kind of 
that the Kazakh economy is going to be 2.5% lower than expected, I mean, kind of, or is going to develop in 2.5% GDP. And I think that the governments around the world are going to, 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 to kind of deviate from GDP growth like China did in the, during the last plenary session in, in the parliament, where they told that we're not going to announce our GDP this year as they did before. And which means that the, the real economy, the structures of economy is going to change. And I agree with Shaidabek is that we cannot kind of think about long term in, in the long term in terms of the economy or national plan, because these measures were, were, were taken specifically for the first wave of lockdown, the first lockdown. The second lockdown is going to be, as Marlene said, more difficult. And I don't know whether we are going to, how we're going to work in the next year, because traditionally Kazakhstan has this kind of tradition of putting Kazakhstan 2050, Kazakhstan 2030, all these long-term plans. And uh, in this respect, it's very difficult to even plan for five years. And that's why uh, the sense of unpredictability and these black swans are going to be around in the air for uh, at least a year. Yeah, thanks, Iskander. Uh, I will just do an outrageous bit of marketing on the back of that since you mentioned uh, Kazakhstan, but uh, the Chatham House report on on Kazakhstan, which you can see on your screens, for those who've got it open, is, uh, was released in Russian just this week. Um, and if you, uh, it's still, for, for my money, having reread it recently, it still holds, and uh, you can get that off the Chatham House website, and maybe in a few months' time, uh, buy a physical copy if we can get back into the office. But um, I think, uh, I think that because COVID hasn't changed everything and has exacerbated existing trends, uh, no more, no less, then then it's still it's still worth a read, even if I do say so myself. Right, Erica, I warned you. Um, uh, Martin Sokolov's question was um, really asking you to elaborate on your point about the risk of radicalization. I mean, to read it out, he says that, you know, uh, you know has COVID-19 the capacity, taking into consideration its economic and societal and political impacts, to contribute to violent um, extremist organizations gaining support even from members of the, of the Central Asian countries? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I really, I'm asking, you, you mentioned it, uh, Erica, but I suppose my, if I just to elaborate on the question, it would be, you know, I understand that there's a risk, there's a risk of everything right now, all risks are, um, are heightened. What's your evidence to suggest that there is a, there is, there is a risk of, of, of increased fundamentalist, and increased fundamentalism, I'm sorry. So I didn't exactly mean uh, increased religious fundamentalism. This is right. not what I, this is not what I meant. Uh, what I think um, is uh, already true, and we see signs of it um, in Central Asia or around the world, is uh, people, um, for, the, for the lack of certainty and lack of clear communication from central authorities, national authorities, uh, people resort to all sorts of conspiracy theories about, um, about COVID, how, how it came about, whether it's true or not, um, what to do against it. And we see that uh, quite a few people, we don't have exact polling, of course, but quite a few people believe um, in uh, a variety of uh, conspiracy theories. And uh, this lack of information or agreement on basic facts throughout Central Asia provides space for um, further, further disinformation, for populist politics, um, for um, spread of radical ideas, be they religious, political, mm. ethno-nationalist. Mm. Um, it's just this breeding gr ground and this uncertainty in economic um, shutdown um, and fear of um, he own health and own um, uh, you know prospects uh, of, for, for the future uncertainty about the prospect of, for the future um, it creates this really fertile ground for um, the spread of um, radical ideas in general uh, they may be religious but they may also be of a different kind understood okay uh, thank you for that important yeah you can yeah, yeah, please, Iskander first, then Marlin. Yeah. Yeah, I can take this uh, specific question on the uh, so called religious radicalism in terms of the, the if, you, if we allow this concept. Um, if you look at the, the latest statistics and da data, for example, what's happening in the Middle East, um, the latest, latest activities of ISIS in Syria and Iraq, uh, there were some loopholes from the government side and the, from international partners in Syria, for example, where like 40% of the population of Syria is still living not under the government like control and the ISIS activities are still there. And this uh, pandemic, uh, we didn't hear during this pandemic much about the ISIS, if, you, if you, we can all agree. And this is a kind of a good opportunity for this kind of radical organization, uh, terrorist organization who can kind of regroup 
uh, re, uh, kind of regain their power in some limited terms, but certainly kind of uh, uh, act in, the, in, in different parts of the world. For example, in Afghanistan, uh, some, ISIS, uh, some members of ISIS Khorasan actually taken uh, responsibility for killing people uh, and blowing, uh, exploding the hospital in Kabul, uh, killing hundreds, uh, like not, uh, many people. Uh, so for uh, terrorist organizations, this can be a good opportunity. And I, I can suggest you, recommend you to, to look at the, the comments and reports by, made by the Peter Newman, who is an expert actually on the terrorism and he specifically yes. wrote on the COVID-19 and the spread of the terrorist activities in the Middle East and other parts of the world. Got it. Marlene, please. Yeah, if I can add on that, I think we should be very careful in making a connection between accentuating poverty and kind of radicalism or terrorism. I think the links is not, is not really okay. there. It's not because you are poor that you will get uh, uh, radicalized. A lot of people who get radicalized religiously, uh, I mean religiously, or let's say radicalized in the sense of uh, joining a, a, a terrorist organization are not necessarily the poorest. They can be really part of the middle classes. Right, so I would be careful in doing that links. Okay. What I think is happening, what Erica was mentioning, is that the, losing the trust in the state capacity in managing this crisis open also an ideological space to fill out with other things. This can be conspiracy theory. It can be also the notion that Islam would give you a solution or a political vision of Islam would bring you a solution. So I think if we see anything happening between the current crisis and the relationship to Islam, it will not be on the field of radicalization and terrorism. It will be more like the kind of cultural Islamization of the society as a way mm -hmm. to strengthen, to build resilience, new form of network of solidarity, of charity, of giving meaning to things that are happening, but so that more on this kind of cultural Islamization potentially than on anything related to kind of terrorism uh, and, and, and violent radicalism. Very important point. Thank you very much, Marlene. I'm going to switch topics again. This one's about agriculture, possibly therefore for Sherbeck. I don't know, sorry. Um, from uh, Aset Odabayev asks, uh, what do you think about the problem of the agricultural set, uh, sector in Central Asia? Um, increase in food prices or lack of food in the region? What can you say about that, please, uh, Sherbeck, maybe? Okay, uh, let me first uh, very five cents on the radicalization topic. Ah, okay, I'm in sorry, general, I didn't realize you... In the past please. two, yeah. three years, I have a strong impression that there's a hype over this PVE, uh, there's this vocabulary yep. of donor agencies. And if we can assume that 50% of this attention is driven by the agenda of the, those who just bring in the money for the research and media, uh, then we can expect that COVID basically is replacing that. So COVID will be the new terrorism, new radical Islamization, new, the PPE to a great extent will be replaced by COVID. Now all the public attention, all the research, all these conferences like this, I could easily imagine that two years ago, this kind of Zoom will be, dis will be discussing the sources of recruitment of the people to Syria and so on. So the issue, of course, will not be uh, removed. And I completely agree with Eric and uh, Marlene as, as they, they comments. But this portion of PVE, this preventing violent extremism rhetoric that was driven too much by donor, I think that will be just replaced by uh, COVID. And uh, okay. yes, on agricultural sector, honestly, of course, I don't know much. I'm not an economist. But my sense is that uh, when we speak about central agency economies, this has been, even from the Soviet period, particularly for Tajik, Uzbek, and Kyrgyzstan, uh, our assets, our items of exports. If you look at what we export to Russia, other than Chinese products uh, made uh, kind of with the label of made in Kyrgyzstan, those are the agricultural stuff. And in that sense, I think uh, COVID basically revived domestic agriculture. The Eurasian Economic Union has already been pushing that trend. And now people basically eat fruits, go to the pharmacy, that's, and they don't spend money on anything else, right? So, but more in general, in terms of the supply chain, whether some countries will stop exporting grain to others, that's, I think, a big issue. So far, we haven't seen uh, much more to the, other than the uh, pandemic of the fear or the anxiety. But in the long term and the bigger scale, I don't know. But so far, I see the existing chunks of agriculture are 
working hard now. They had a good time now. Thank you very much indeed. I'll, I'll move on. Um, having said that, I, I'm a little short of questions, so don't be shy if anybody wants to raise a hand or, or add more to the chat. So I'll, I'll fill in one of my own. It's inspired by something Marlene said right at the very beginning. Um, and it's, Marlene, you, you mentioned that in, in, with respect to sort of reliance on Russia and migration remittances, that the region is, is quite a globalised region in this respect. It's funny because I, I don't really think of Central Asia as being particularly globalised. And I, uh, it just seemed, it's a, to be perfectly honest, and I don't mean this as being offensive, but it, you know, it, it is perfectly reasonable if you look at Central Asia from a global standpoint of view, if you think of it as a regional backwater. So few people care about it. Um, and so, be, so few people have been there, you know, even in an international relations think tank or a uh, center for, for international studies as you and I work in, then, then I, I think it just tends to be the ignored part of the world by and large. So I, I, I somehow doubt still the, the globalization of a region. So my, my, my question is to you and probably Iskander again is, is you know how will how how will your prognosis how, how how does how does COVID and the region development how does it affect the globalization of Central Asia regardless of how how globalized you think it is in the first place if we differ on that maybe Marlene and Iskander yeah I think that that you're raising a, a a great point I think it depends how we want to define globalization and at which level we want to look at. Uh, uh, of course, if you look in terms of, I don't know, infrastructure and regional trade, then Central Asia is not globalized, it's kind of marginalized. If you look at the role of labor migration, the role of remittances, it's a globalized region. It's a region where diaspora really matters because they are the one bringing money home. If you look in terms of how offshoring of money strategy, then the Central Asian elites are very much globalized. Fair if enough. you look in, in, and so in a sense, it's, China is the big point of globalization in the sense that suddenly the region has been uh, uh, connected to a big country playing a role in trying to globalize uh, uh, um, the world or at least the, the, the old continent. But I think on many aspects, if you, look from the, if you look at the world level, of course, Central Asia is a mini places that doesn't create a lot of interest. But if you look from the Central Asian societies, People on the ground, I think, also can feel very much globalized in a sense that almost everybody as member of the families living abroad, every member as, as every family as people uh, uh, in labor migration, people feel the influence of Russia or China, they feel the influence of the Emirates, for example. So I think there are many kind of more cultural or social economic aspects that we usually don't see that make that Central Asian people, the society themselves, mm -hmm. are in fact quite globalized. And I even don't speak about the elites who are totally uh, uh, globalized. Fair enough. Iskander, please. Uh, I fully agree with Marlene, specifically that uh, living in Central Asia, we, feel, we, we don't feel that we are landlocked, for example, uh, yes, physically, yes, we are. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, spiritually, intellectually, that we, we, we actually see, would like to visit Europe and uh, other Asian countries. We have flights, etc. So, uh, speaking geopolitically, yes, we, uh, as, a, as a region itself, as a five countries, we may not possess this kind of capacity to, to present ourselves as a kind of a, a powerhouse as a European Union or other unions, even like ASEAN countries. So we don't have this kind of this capacity. We don't have even kind of... Uh, politically institutionalized union as ASEAN or Nordic Council or other kind of unions. We have kind of informal Central Asian meetings between the leaders. So this is a process in making and we, we kind of need to acknowledge our weaknesses. And uh, it's uh, leading to the question, how central is Central Asia? So uh, we would like to see ourselves as a central and we would to, just to deviate from the Soviet Middle East, Middle Asia. So, uh, uh, why we can be interesting is because of the, the strategic uh, uh, closeness and geography to Russia and China. Speaking with the uh, like Western and Japanese or Asian experts, why we are so much can be studied is through the, because we are linked to the Belt and Road, Eurasian Economic Union, it's kind of big uh, institutions uh, just that include many countries uh, in, in the capacity of China and Russia. That's why we can be interesting. And we still have Afghanistan issue, which is uh, still there. And that's why we have US kind of focus on that. And recently Trump has claimed that uh, we can at any time bring back our soldiers to Afghanistan. And Afghanistan is still there. Uh, it's not so far from Central Asia. Well, that's why kind of uh, there is uh, the, the biggest kind of US uh, interest in Central Asia is mainly Afghanistan. And if you look at the, the latest US strategy to Central Asia, 
out of six points that U.S. government mentioned, four points belong to Afghanistan. So Afghanistan is basically the, the kind of the sole uh, interest uh, mm. of U.S. to this region. And now there is a China. And since we are close to China, we can be much be in the radar, radar of other great powers. So Charles Garrett has added to my own question on globalization. And he says, do you see the Central Asian states in that case in, uh, coming into closer relationships with international organizations, encouraging them into greater collaboration within their rules-based international system? So is there any prospect that Central Asia becomes, oh, I don't know if more westernized is the right term, it's, it's really not. But, but if, if, they, if, they, if they do become, if, they, if we, we talk about Russia and China all the time, but we, we haven't been speaking about their relationship with the West or Western-led rules-based international organizations. What about the possibilities there, please? Well, I can add just a few yeah. on that and, and let the other. Yeah. I think the Central Asian states are already member of as many world organiza international organizations as they can. It's part of their strategy since the <laughs> 90s to really become a member of almost everything where it's possible to be a member because they see that as a strategy also for national prestige, just to be recognized as a, being part of this international community. So there is a kind of nation branding uh, uh, aspect. And I would be careful in... in conflating this kind of international system with anything rule-based or Western style. I think it's two different things. Many of the world organizations that are kind of UN-based uh, are voting by, by majority, right? So it's not really the Western countries that are domi dominating them on many aspects. Uh, the Central Asian states are part of a lot of institutions that have mostly symbolic role and not a lot, but that contribute to the socialization of, of uh, Central Asian diplomacy. So I think on that, they are already very well internationalized. They know very well how the system functions. They know how they can play the system uh, uh, quite well, trying to get money on different sides, trying to get partnership on different sides. So, and I don't think the West has anything more interesting to offer to the, the, the regimes that, that mm -hmm. now, that, that the others can have. I mean, we are, expensive, not reliable, and having kind of a, a political agenda of whatever democratization rule of law we want to call it, that doesn't fit them. And except the West, there has a lot of other international organization where you can be a member without any of these issues. So I don't think there is any chance for the West to try to speak to the regimes, at least at that level. Maybe we can speak to the society, but clearly not at the regime's level. Well, that is a shame. But I see your logic, Malin, yes. Um, having asked for more questions, I am now a victim of that because I now have far too many and we have five minutes to go. But I'm going to just sort of arbitrarily pick one. And actually, it's particularly arbitrary because somebody has already asked a question, but it's a particularly good one. Martin Sokolov has come up with a corker whereby he's asking if the pandemic is impacting the transition of power in Kazakhstan. But I won't just limit it to Kazakhstan and elsewhere. I mean, Martin's talking about the role of Nur Sultan Nazarbayev and the recent presidential decree to increase the power of President Takayev, what's happened with Dariga, of course, there recently. Uh, and so I, I suppose the broader question then, Martin, is, is will this hasten the departure of any of our dearly beloved Central Asian leaders? And I'll go to everybody there, um, uh, so because it's the last question, as I say. Uh, so let's, let's do it in sort of reverse order with Iskander first, then Sherbek and Erika and Malin. Well, this is uh, last but not the least. I mean, yeah. this is a brilliant question, and uh, we are experiencing the the kind of uh, the political transition is still is still there. It's not it's not finished. Yes, uh, on the procedural level, there is a new president, but still kind of uh, the the ideas, the measures, the old habits die hard. This kind of approach uh, is still there. Uh, certainly, the COVID nineteen and the the, the the latest changes within the government apparatus. Um, has strengthened President Tukai's position. And uh, we see that the, the changes within the personnel and the, the latest uh, the step down of uh, former Speaker of Senate uh, is a sh showcase of that. But still there, is, there are some kind of rumors from different side uh, whether we're going to see some people to coming back to the political scene. So still there is a, a, a room for maneuver and uh, some people can come, come back. But, but mm -hmm. I would like to say that uh, transition uh, is happening not only in the government on the government level uh, transition in, the, in the, the mindset of society is still there I mean it's also going on uh, people are changing their, their kind of attitudes their perceptions there are other voices that are coming up and we see kind of diversification of political opinions uh, so that they kind of competing on the different sides and uh, 
I believe that the social contract that was established specifically after the collapse of the Soviet Union, where there was a single strong leader, is changing. And we, now I think we are coming closer to more collective, gradually, I'm saying gradually coming to more collective way of operating the, the, the government mechanism, because we will not have as strong leader as president, former president as I were, but what we can have uh, is a gradual institutional collective based approach where the, the, there is a president and then there is a strong parliament. So uh, it will have some kind of uh, uh, back and forth uh, way, uh, ways where we have, will have a seen mistakes, etc. But it will, it will need to take time. And uh, I think that the biggest role belongs to the civil society itself because they need to transform as well. I mean, not only the government and they, they need to take a kind of uh, bolder and more substantial actions in a constructive way. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Iskander. Sherbeck, uh, impact on transitions? Mm, okay, can I just quickly also touch on the Ambassador Gerrit's uh, question about the, how the crisis, whether it will bring closer to international organizations, particularly this rule-based international system. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, we've been observing that, uh, interestingly, it wasn't China and Russia, but mostly European institutions or international multilateral organizations where we went, asked for money and received IMF. We almost forgot about IMF for many years since a few times. Now we know IMF again uh, with two tranches. However, and I think this international community based in Bishkek must be very much, they already know, but they must be aware about, is that this movement is very much forced action and uh, the latest developments with NGO law suggests that the government isn't really accepting the rule-based international system. It's a very pragmatic move searching for money, but efforts, extra efforts must be made to make sure that this uh, reviving relationship will bring the government towards closer to the rule-based system. We know that Central Asian governments, including Kyrgyzstan, has been growing increasingly arrogant against this, uh, what we call international, we, we mean Western uh, rule-based system, uh, with the downgrading of the OEC, one of the biggest uh, examples. So I think uh, kind of double-edged answer is there. As for the last question about the impact of the crisis on the political dynamics, on the prospects of the incumbents or the, here, I think the hope of the, any incumbent would be that the COVID pandemic will generate this rally around the flag impact so that just like in South Korea, the government won predominant landslides during the COVID. Unfortunately for them, for Kyrgyz, uh, for Central Asian governments possibly, that's not really gonna happen, I think, uh, because the government lacks resources and the government has rather generated negative reactions from the society rather than uh, uh, the positive. So what I expect, and we have parliamentary elections coming up in the autumn, uh, and presidential election mm -hmm. is just, presidents have just one term, so basically it's also about a test for the next presidential elections. Mm -hmm. We will most likely see the fragmentation of the political uh, forces, and if the ruling government, ruling party, or there's no ruling party now, but uh, we know who the group is, if they want to prolong their life, uh, prolong their uh, control over the government, mm -hmm. they will need to go for greater repressive methods. Otherwise, I don't see uh, the, the current kind of harmonious relationship between all five parties in the parliament to continue as the elections approach. Thank you. Thank you, Sherbeck. Erica. Yeah, uh, building on Shari Beck's uh, point, it's also uncertain how campaigning will take place. We don't even know who would be the top uh, five players in the elections yet um, in Kyrgyzstan. Um, in, in regards to Tajikistan, I think the president, for as long as he could, tried to present a, a picture that everything is all right. You know, so we will we'll, we'll have celebrations. We're going uh, about our life as normal. Um, and I think that's in conjunction with his attempts to establish his son as a successor. So his son mm. is now second in line um, and it will be very important for him to preserve the image of you know ha happiness all around in Tajikistan without having to consult with uh, the society that generally depends on migrant remittances um, and doesn't expect much from the government anyways so this dynamics will change and one note on Uzbekistan I think this pandemic demonstrated that um, 
the political transition in Uzbekistan has been completed. Um, and Mirziyoyev uh, has established himself in, uh, comfortably in power and has already built a robust uh, PR machine, messaging machine, um, inside the country and outside the country, in the region as well, uh, communicating exactly what his government is doing and how he is tackling the pandemic. And that, that is, of course, helping his popularity as well. Thanks, Erica. Malin, you seem to have the last, the last word, actually. And I, I remember, just to quote your article again, your Pernas Eurasia article, I think I, mean, I read it some weeks ago now, but my, my, my recollection is that your conclusion was that their, their survival, their ability to survive, will sort of depend upon their ability to convince the population that they've handled this crisis adequately. Yeah, I think that the key, the key political points for them, and honestly, it is also for Western state on many, on many aspects to show that they, they did the best they could and the, the, the collateral price was kind of unavoidable. But I would like to second what Erika is saying. I think that for Uzbekistan, the management of the crisis is really a kind of a plus on uh, 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 the, the, the shoulder of the Mirzaev regimes, really showing how they have been able to, to manage it uh, uh, the best they could, in, at least in, in, in the way they have been presenting it. But clearly in Uzbekistan now, there is really a, a new regime functioning uh, uh, fully and entirely under uh, Mirziyev uh, uh, control. In Kazakhstan, as Iskander was, was saying, uh, uh, the things are more complicated. And I think we really have to mm. look at how Tokayev will be managing the family, the Nazarbayev family, right? Because that's where you really have a, a potential political uh, attention. A, a good thing for Mirzoyev when he arrived in power is that the Karimov family was already out of uh, the political system and he didn't have to deal with, uh, with Gulnara. She was already outside uh, a few years before he arrived in power. And now Tokayev has, if he really wants to be able to build his power, will have to deal with the, the power of the Nazarbayev family. And we have seen one first a step in relationship to Dariga. So I think for Kazakhstan, there is still kind of long step to see how the, the Tokayev regime will be able to consolidate. And of course, how things evolve in Russia may also have an impact on how uh, uh, the, the, the Tokayev regime will be able to, to kind of consolidate itself. Thank you very much, Marlene, absolutely. Well, of course, I, I'm massively prejudiced, ladies and gentlemen, but that was easily the best discussion on the impacts of COVID on Central Asia development that I've heard in the last um, eight weeks or so. So my immense thanks to, to, to all the panelists. Um, I was going to give the last word to my co-chair, uh, Abba Consul for Nazarov, but in fact, he has asked me if I could give the final closing remarks to the um, ex executive director of Institute for War and Peace Reporting, Tony Borden. So Tony, if we could unmute you, please. I don't think you're a co-host. And can you unmute Tony, then uh, the last few words. But in the meantime, just before you say anything, it's an absolute pleasure to work with you, Tony and Abakon and, and, and Jamelia as well. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Hope to do it again sometime. And uh, we appreciate you all listening. Chatham House, for its part, will continue to, 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 to write and speak on these issues. My colleagues, Lubitsa Polakova and Kate Mallinson have got uh, pieces coming out on the impacts of COVID on the Caucasus and Central Asia um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, but uh, we will do a lot more of this, I, I am sure, including with you. Tony, over to you. Yeah, thank you, James. Um, the main reason uh, to, for me to intervene is to make sure that we thank the IWR team adequately enough, as well as Chatham House and all of the speakers. I'd agree that it's just been a fascinating and really intriguing discussion, and it shows that despite um, our separation, somehow the mag magic of of, of this technology allows us to come together. And I really think um, it, this, this was not just the best on Central Asia, but on many of the conferences, I'm sure you've been on many, uh, uh, and I feel very much the same way. Um, fortunately, there needs to be no summary of the discussion because our excellent teams at IDPR and Chatham House will be posting online. There'll be a report, there'll be a summary. I think there'll even be a, 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 a you, can, you can relive the entire experience. <laughs> uh, so that's fantastic. Uh, and and, and um, I certainly um, would thank uh, Sherbeck, Erica, Iskander, and Marlene in particular for their really terrific and precise contributions. I think you uh, complemented each other very well. I have to say, looking at your, your uh, CVs, it makes me heart sick because I should be in Kazakhstan. I'm often in Washington. I miss London <laughs> above all where I actually reside. The only place I have to admit is I broke uh, lockdown to go to St. Andrews just the other day to pick up my daughter from university. So Sherman, <laughs> I, was, I was just nearby. Um, 
but it, it, it reminds us of this globalized world that we all ache and miss so much. And I congratulate you for pulling it together uh, so well. <clears throat> I, 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 I think we see what the experts are telling us is that this hasn't changed things. It's exacerbated the trends. What we don't know is, um, I, I don't think it's democracy versus non-democracy, society, non-democratic societies that deal with COVID better. It's coherent or cohesive societies versus uh, incoherent ones. You can have a chaotic democracy that can make a mess of it. You can make an incompetent dictatorship that will make a mess of it. A, an effective dictatorship will do well and a trust-based, uh, well-functioning democracy can also do well. So this gives to me some lot of uh, granularity and understanding uh, how we may think Central Asia is and can respond. I think we all flagged, thank you for my uh, question, James, that there is a, there is a, what we don't know is something acute is going to happen that changes the dynamic further. It sounds like political stability is really what the governments are trying to maintain. And if a second wave makes things acute, and whether that throws it out of balance uh, is, is all to see. I mean, from the Adipar perspective, we try to be uh, regionally focused and, and build bridges. We also try to be um, focused across the society internally. We think that trust is really the biggest factor and if civil society can engage, but also if official factors can engage together and across the borders, uh, that's our best hope. And that's certainly what the team um, does uh, we're really honored to partner with Chatham House in this, so thank you above all, James. Um, but um, really, I'm only here because uh, our Central Asian team is also modest and they would not uh, toot their own horn, horn loud enough. And it's not just Abahan, but uh, our wonderful Central Asian, Kabar Central Asia team that we congratulate. So thank you very much, everybody. What I don't know is whether you're able to um, lift the global mute lock so that we could congratulate our speakers in one, but whether it's loud or mute, um, I think we all share lots of thanks and congratulations to everybody who participated and spoke so well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.